recent study carried out by the team from University College London claims that frequent visits to museums and galleries statistically lead to a longer life, or to put it in another words, the more you do something culturally significant, such as visiting an art gallery, the better your chances are of enjoying a longer lifespan. Besides, museums can contribute to the life quality of certain societal groups. While being treated as honorable institutions serving as a role model for the major part of society, museums can either perpetuate and establish long-standing prejudices or discriminatory approaches, either took a more inclusive stance and reflect diverse societies with their multitude of identities, experiences, and frames of references. So who are actually using these benefits of museums? Are they available for everyone, or just the traditional elites? Despite their significant efforts to become more inviting, inclusive, or even actively arguing for particular values, museums are still struggling on their way, claims Richard Sandel, a professor of museum studies and director of Research Center for Museums and Galleries at the University of Leicester. Adapting his research experience and scientific evidence in practical collaborations with museums and galleries, Mr. Sandel claims that the values of accessibility and inclusion should be at the heart of any cultural institution. Today, meeting in a museum offers a combination of practical and theoretical insights in the field of museum's inclusion and participatory approaches. Join us and let me guide it through. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, um, when we are speaking about museum visitors, can we speak about all of them as some kind of unified group? as a general thing, or are we speaking about more differentiated, differentiated more diverse groups? Um, I think it's a really good question. I think um, over the last couple of decades, we've got increasingly sophisticated in understanding the diversity of audiences we're trying to reach and just how differently they perceive the museum, engage with the museum, um, also how the opportunities to participate in the museum are incredibly uneven and, un and unequal. And I think museums are still trying to respond to that. So on the one hand, we have you know, a lot of research that shows the relative homogeneity of museum visitors. I mean, despite all the work that happens, they are still um, most strongly visited by particular groups, more, more dominant and elite groups that still predominate in terms of the visitorships of museums. But we, as we understand our audiences and our responsibilities better, we can see a whole swathe of current visitors and non-visitors with very, very different opportunities and experiences and perceptions that museums on the whole, are trying to kind of respond to and engage with that greater understanding of diversity. Um, I remember that I read once that in a few decades ago, uh, there was kind of an experiment or a policy in the United Kingdom when you just opened your national museums and granted free entry to everyone for them. And I think it was related with curbing that social exclusion and trying to invite all the groups into museums. But I'm not sure how successful was it. And is the financial barrier the main uh, that limits the entry to museums? Yeah, um, the, the the government policy on our national government funded museums and charging has a quite long and checkered history. Really, we've introduced charges in in my lifetime. We've had charges, free admission, partial charges. They they. Um, it's, it's not a single trajectory, but a kind of back and forth a little bit as governments have responded to different imperatives in that way. Um, the, the last uh, opening up of national museums with free admission, you're right to say it highlighted the part that financial barriers play, and it is by no means the whole picture. So there is some research which suggests that some of those museums that went free grew the total visitor numbers, but were less successful in broadening the range of people that visited. So essentially, some people could argue that 
free admission brought in more of the same kinds of people, more of the affluent and highly educated audiences. So they've attracted some criticism for that. At the same time, there is also research which shows that the, the biggest growth in new audiences were people from less traditional backgrounds. And so it's a mixed and complicated picture. On the one hand, I would agree free financial barriers are not the only things that prevent people from visiting. And it would be um, naive of any museum to think that if it removes charges, it fixes its access and inclusion problem. But I absolutely fully agree with that. And so there are many other barriers um, which we can think about, which we know exist, which explain and account for underrepresentation by different groups. But I still personally have a strong uh, affinity with free admission. I've worked in museums where I've seen just how powerful free admission can be. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't fix everything, but it creates a visiting experience that doesn't, um, you know, it's not the only barrier, but it is a significant barrier for some people. And for those people on lower incomes, any charge at all is likely to deter them. But if you create an experience where people can pop in and out, it's not always a full day's destination where they need to get their value for money, but they can instead build museums into part of their life a bit more easily and a bit more freely. I think that paves the way for a more inclusive experience. Um, so at the moment we have free admission to most of our nationally funded institutions but what we find is quite um, even in those museums which are free at the point of entry a lot of them have introduced paywalls so around temporary exhibitions around um, other kinds of special experience which still creates a a two-tiered approach and I think that's because those museums want to generate income they want to um, other than the kind of visitor related income they can get through shops and cafes so it, it's a, a mixed picture uh, and one that needs more attention but I think I, I would certainly favour free admission and want to look at other ways in which those barriers that still exclude people can also be addressed in tandem. Museums are working in such a complex environment and they have so many stakeholders to serve. Um, they face expectations from the government, from the visitors, uh, and besides, they need to think about inclusion uh, and participation. So what's the way to set the priorities and how to uh, how to start to think about the process of engagement. Yeah, museums are fascinating in that regard, aren't they? They're quite unique with that diversity of stakeholders and expectations, I think. Um, from my own perspective, I've always been um, trying to make the case for a more democratic, more inclusive, more equitable way of thinking to be at the absolute core of the organisation. So unwavering, unerring commitment to try and have the widest possible range of beneficiaries feels really important to me. It feels like it's at the heart of what any museum should be. Now, that means you still have to be pragmatic. You still have to manage different stakeholder expectations and so on. But putting, I think the problem is that in some organisations, I feel like they've slightly lost their way and that inclusion and diversity takes a back seat and um, is weighed up as one amongst a number of uh, expectations or activities. And I think what I've always tried to argue is that it shouldn't be part of that kind of optional mix to deal with. It has to be prioritised. It has to be at the heart of the organisation 
um, expressed through an explicit commitment to be that idealist thing, to be a museum for everybody as far as that is possible. Um, and I think there are always compromises in any pragmatic arrangements that flow from that. But more and more, I see organisations. There's, on the one hand, you know, there is a growing consensus around that as a key feature of museums. You know, we see the debates around the ICOM definition, dividing people, but nevertheless, the idea that museums should be more inclusive, that it should be more reflective of society and its concerns has, when I started in museums, was kind of here on the margins, was on the outside of the organisation and the core remained quite unchanged. And over the last 20 or 30 years, that idea has permeated every single museum in some way or another. There is an acceptance that they've been elite organisations that need to be more democratic and more inclusive. You see that for better or worse in almost every museum I can think of. So that has become a much more central concern. But of course, there is still there is still so much to do and there is there are still worrying trends. My colleague in the research centre has been looking at the marketization of museums, so the growing kind of commercial imperatives which increasingly drive public space and looking at ways in which museums could hold on to uh, to kind of push back against those forces and I found that enormously influential. So having a commitment to whatever we words work for any context, I know they're different in different countries, but when I talk more generally about inclusion and, and equity and justice, finding ways to cement that at the heart of the organisation at least gives you some kind of compass to push back against forces that encroach upon that and that diminish the museum's capacity in that area. Easier said than done, it's a real challenge on the ground, but I think uh, when we lose sight of that, we lose sight of the essence of the museum, really. I think that now you are saying it quite theoretically, but uh, I read about, I guess, one of the best examples when you were uh, participating in the creation of the exhibition Being Human. And could you tell a bit more about that process? Because I think um, it was a really collaborative one and you consulted a lot of people with various experiences so that the exhibition would be as attractive for all the possible groups of society as possible. Yeah, that's a recent project, um, the Welcome Collection in London, um, a large medical and health themed museum, a really, um, a really great institution in many, many ways, um, approached the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries at the University of Leicester and asked if we could work in collaboration around the development of a new permanent gallery, which became called Being Human and which opened uh, just a few months ago. And one of the great things about working in our research centre, we don't go and do research, we don't go out and research museums and then come back to our uh, university settings. All of the research is done collaboratively, so we bring researchers from the university, but we work with many practitioners, in this case uh, from the Welcome Collection, and we brought in other additional experts, particularly people with lived experience of disability, to work together to collaboratively research and shape what that organisation would do. So it's a very exciting dynamic process and I learned a huge amount along the way. The project was initially conceived as an attempt to disrupt or kind of puncture the dominant narrative in that institution. So we were approached, I think, because we've done a lot of work around the ways in which stories of disability, of physical and mental difference, can be told in museums and why they should be told and what, what they can do. And medical museums, of which the Welcome Collection is one, um, have a really difficult relationship with disability. So they tend to 
reflect a broader medicalized view of the world in which people with physical or mental differences are somehow deviant, different, they need to be fixed or cured. So difference is seen as inherently undesirable. Um, and so many disabled people hate medical museums or anything with that theme because they feel um, excluded and oppressed. They feel their lives are shown in hierarchical ways, which are they're dehumanized, they're devalued. Um, and the Welcome Collection wanted to look at how they could address that in a largely a kind of medically driven organization. So it was a really intriguing challenge. And we looked initially at saying, OK, there's a, there's a largely medicalized story. How do we puncture or disrupt that through the views of uh, the disability rights movement and disabled campaigners? What was so exciting to all of us along that journey is that the, the gallery that came out at the other end of that process is very, very different. It's, there are great effort has gone to tell that story of health and medicine and well-being and how we live today, where the whole story 
I guess um, all the groups that are misrepresented or um, feel a lack of inclusion are especially vulnerable now in times of COVID, as those differences are especially visible and felt. So is there anything that museums could do or are doing to help to cope with the current situation? Yeah, um, I guess a lot of museums have, um, there was a rush to put things online. Um, there is uh, a lot of effort going into kind of reopening and a lot of the discussions have been around instead of going back to normal, which actually was pretty unequal for many people anyway, how can we try and build in greater equality into the, the our kind of reset and reopening of these organisations? And I think... Um, some are not doing so well with that. So we see a kind of um, debate, for example, in North America, where the financial challenges presented by COVID have been have translated into museums um, just getting rid of their education and engagement staff. And people have said, well, it's as if that never really was at the core of what you did. And as soon as financial challenges hit, that gets the first thing to get cut. And we've seen that pattern in earlier kind of economic downturns. I think the best organisations, it's going back full circle to your first question really, are, and maybe there aren't that many of them sadly in the museum world, but I think the best of them are trying to keep inclusion, diversity, equality as a, at the heart of the organisation and use that to, to help them make difficult decisions so that they don't continue to, uh, in many ways, punish those marginalised audiences, but look for ways to uh, address some of that prior exclusion. Um, in some ways, it feels like we're right in the middle of that now. I think the next few months will be very telling, and it's um, undoubtedly the less well-off communities have been the hardest hit by COVID generally, and it would be a shame if that was compounded by cultural institutions. So um, some of those that I'm continue to work with, it's, uh, it's looking at ways of holding that commitment to equality and seeing if that can help shift priorities so that we can address some of those inequalities. And to jump a bit back, I was also wondering, when you were speaking about your idea of activist museum, is it some kind of a gradual change in a museum? Should a museum become more inclusive and then take that more activist role or role of uh, inspiring some change in, in, the, in the dominant norms? Or can that part of inclusiveness be just skipped? So just a classic museum, traditional museum, can just one day decide that this organizational and, and changes in values is needed. So I'm not sure if I'm clear enough, but I was just wondering, is it like three steps or more steps process, or it can just be a sudden shift in, 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 in values? Yeah, I think it can be uh, a sudden shift, whether it's a change in values or a re-articulation of values. Um, but it's certainly, um, it can, and I think it, it should happen. And I think what we see with, the rush of statements by cultural organisations um, after the killing of George Floyd is exactly what you've described. It is a, a rupture. It is a sudden, um, almost forced acknowledgement that the museum is complicit in those things and therefore has a role to play in addressing them. So even those organisations that traditionally see themselves as outside as, as jumping into contemporary issues as being something beyond their remit, even those organisations have felt the need to issue statements of support of Black Lives Matter. So it is that quite sharp process. Of course, where the internal practice of that organisation is not in line with the statement, so th th we start to see those problems. So museums being called out for making hollow gestures, um, statements without addressing their you know, their uh, resources, the way they treat their staff, uh, their exhibition program, their collections and so on. But museums are massively 
complex. We know that they're slow to change on the whole. So I'm reluctant to say, you know, you've got to first become accessible, then be inclusive and then be activist because we'd be at this for many, many decades more without seeing the change that we need. So I think um, I personally am sort of taking the opportunity presented by um, recent events to work collaboratively with organisations to move them on as fully and as quickly as possible. And some of the other work needs to catch up behind that, I suppose. Um, these things are interlinked. I mean, I've, um, in an earlier paper, I tried to unravel, I used the lens of, of disability to look at how there's a sort of trajectory of thinking and practice in museums. So um, if you have museums um, trying to respond to the disability rights movement, and you look back um, 40, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, museums were responding by saying, we need to be more accessible. We need to put in ramps and lifts and handrails and large print because the disability rights movement is asking for equal access to all of facilities and that includes schools and hospitals and so on. So you start to see that being the dominant response um, and they didn't do it very well and they still don't, but museums trying to be more accessible. And then some years later, again, in response to expectations from disability equality campaigners, some museums starting to recognise that the world's largest minority, as it's sometimes called disabled people, their histories and cultures have very often been erased or misrepresented in museums. So how can we tell stories that are more inclusive of physical and mental difference? So there's a kind of corrective. We're taking this uh, maybe elite, homogenous history and pluralising it. We're telling different stories within it. And then the third phase, if that first one is access, the second one is inclusion, and the third one is activism, it's saying, why are we telling those inclusive stories? We're telling them because we have the capacity to act upon contemporary prejudice and discrimination. So why don't we go full blown in that direction and really shape things so that we speak up about injustices? Why shouldn't we? And then, so those are sort of three phases I tried to conceptualize. Um, and then they're not, they are interlinked, but they're not all sequential in that sense. So, you know, it's a constant reminder to me and actually being human was one case where in a way we were quite, we were thinking on the kind of inclusion and activism border of what we were trying to do. And then the people we worked with said, you know, don't forget to be accessible. There's no point being having these great narratives if people can't get in and see them. And you'll just be reinforcing and perpetuating and showing your true colours if you don't address all of those things together. So there is a strong relationship between them. Um, I think access should be, access and inclusion should be the baseline. We should be just doing that as fully as possible. It doesn't always have to cost more. We know how to do it. Uh, it's committing to a process. It is documented and we should be able to really take that as a minimal, a fairly uncontested thing. Where I think we're in more challenging territory is more in that activist role because when, depending on the issue, when museums take up a standpoint on disability equality, race equality, um, even climate breakdown, LGBTQ issues, they there is always the potential if you're trying to change society, you will always provoke some backlash and managing that and accommodating that is one of the biggest challenges we face. I think museums need to do it. They need to do it more, but there are ways of doing it that take more people with you rather than trigger kind of really uncomfortable controversies. If we look across Europe, you know, people, museum directors have lost their jobs. Um, museums, have faced all sorts of challenges over contested histories because people are strongly invested in particular ways of talking about the nation and its history. Um, so none of that is straightforward, not as straightforward as being more accessible, for example. But I think there are frameworks, there are ways of working 
that move us forward. And some of the projects that I've been involved with show that it might be difficult, but if we, we bring research on particularly around museum ethics, we bring that to bear on the museum to sort of give them a strong uh, basis for that more challenging, more difficult area of work. Um, and I think it shows that you can push through some of those things. You might get some backlash, you might get some controversy, but um, it's also surprising how far you can go and should go. So you said there are those three stages that, that we discussed. So what's what's waiting for us in the future? Or what's waiting for museums in the future? What, what would be the fourth stage? <laughs> oh, that's a really good one. Um, I'm not sure I know because I feel we're so um, grappling with and we haven't fixed all those other stages yet in a way. I mean, I suppose um, one of the things I've been trying to explore at the moment is what happens when you put excluded people's lives at the center of what you're trying to do. Um, I'm not going to be very clear about this because it's still very fuzzy in my mind. But again, I suppose um, with a number of the organisations that I work with, even if I think only six months ago, we were trying to think about weaving in, say, black histories or black perspectives into a kind of, you know, a, a mosaic, a, a mix of all those different stakeholder views and so on and something like black lives matter happens and it's so momentous and it's almost like um we can see it clears the fog we can see with greater clarity what needs to be done sort of right here right now and for me that has been that we need to place the lived experience of of people of color at the heart of what we do to, to amplify and privilege that. They're not just kind of correct the balance for a while. We need to look what happens when you, if you want to really redress those systemic problems, you need to amplify, shine a spotlight on and really put that hurt and that exclusion and that violence against black people at the heart of what you might do. And I'm trying to work out what that looks like in practice. There are different things that are playing out. We're using um, positive action, which is like an affirmative action approach to address underrepresentation um, in employment, in um, all, all areas, in fact, of, of the museum. What kind of correctives can we put in place and can we do to, to not just kind of foster change, but to kind of force it to happen. So that's even more challenging for lots of organizations to think through, but some of them are starting to play with that and think about that um, as part of broader decolonizing and equality programs. So kind of a more radical rethink, which requires full acknowledgement of what museums have done and, and accompanied by demands that they change. And I've used Black Lives Matter because we're just so immersed in that at the moment. But I think the broader point about we, we're um, sort of inspired by our experiences of being human. We've talked to a number of cultural organizations. What would you need to do to become the, we would use the phrase, the go-to place for disabled people, the, largest minority in Britain for them to think if we go to that museum or that heritage site we won't just feel kind of accommodated but we will be so fully seen welcomed and included that we'll tell everybody we know you should go to that so how can you do that being human was our first foray I think into that becoming you know, instead of just weaving in disability, really amplifying it, really putting it at the heart of everything. So what, how do you do that? How could you do that more across more places? 
and then I get, think the next stage will be how do you do that in a way that benefits absolutely everybody so not just the the, the group say people of color or disabled people or gay people not just those groups but actually you change things for everybody by privileging and amplifying the needs of one group so, you know um our project with the national trust on lgbtq equality was all about prioritizing previously hidden lgbtq stories but because it was the National Trust, it wasn't a kind of specialist LGBTQ organization. It is the nation's heritage. So in that sense, we tried to center LGBTQ experience, but in properties that are visited by everybody. So we used particular, we experimented with particular techniques, which tried to tell those stories in ways that LGBTQ people were like, oh, wow, my stories featuring here but every other visitor also took notice and left changed and enriched by the process and i think that's a really fascinating balance between addressing past wrongs and also just trying to pull it's kind of why i work with the conservative and mainstream organizations as opposed to the edgy specialist human rights bodies because i think museums have that power to for more fundamental mainstream change I'm not being very clear, but I'm excited about what that might do uh, in the, where, where museums might take that. Yeah, in yeah. The, in, it sounds very exciting and like a really long way to go. <laughs> of course, it depends on the starting point of, of both of our countries. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I see that we're uh, running over the, the time that I asked for you. So thank you once again for agreeing to share your ideas. It was very inspiring and I hope that the the listeners and the readers will think the same. So really, thank you so much.